Good afternoon. My name is Anu Britsi, and I'm going to be speaking to you about the diagnostic criteria for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. I have no financial disclosures. I thought I'd start this talk out with a little bit of light humor. So what do many earlier radiology residents think of when they hear ILD? Alphabet soup. And for good reason. There are many different acronyms used in interstitial lung disease and they can be extremely confusing, which then often leads to this feeling. So ILD can appear very daunting at first glance, but it absolutely isn't. Um, in fact, I tend to think of uh, figuring out which interstitial lung disease a patient has as playing the game Clue, Master Detective Edition, of course. Um, the suspects are all the different ILDs you have, the rooms are the clinical symptoms, and your major weapon is your CT. And of course, if you look under the board at the answer, then that's the equivalent of getting your pathology. Just kidding. Um, so today I'm gonna be speaking to you specifically about IPF. The biggest point that I wanna make is that IPF is not synonymous with UIP. I know this can be very confusing and you often hear people refer to this in a way that makes it sound like they're interchangeable, but they actually are not. Uh, they are not one and the same at all. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is truly idiopathic, which means that there is no known cause for it. Usual interstitial pneumonia is a pathologic and radiologic pattern. UIP can be either idiopathic or non-idiopathic. So I think the easiest way to think of this is that IPF is a very specific type of, I, of UIP. If it's idiopathic UIP, then it's IPF. If it's non-idiopathic, then it's not IPF. So this leads us to the very first criteria for the diagnosis of IPF. You must exclude, exclude known causes of fibrosing ILD, um, which includes systemic causes such as connective tissue disease um, and exposure related causes such as drug toxicity or environmental exposures amongst other causes. Um, and this criteria actually comes verbatim from the ATS multi-society clinical practice guidelines that were published in 2018. And the Fleischner Society white paper, which was published six months earlier in 2018, actually has very similar criteria. Okay, so why is it important to distinguish IPF from non-idiopathic causes of UIP? Why does this even matter? Well, the answer to that is the therapies. So profinidone and nintetinib are the two therapies, they're antifibrotic agents that are approved for use in patients with IPF. Profinidone is only approved for patients with IPF. So if they have anything but IPF, you can't use profinidone in them. Nintetinib has other approved indications, but IPF is one of them. And so the points that I want to make is that you want to have the correct diagnosis so that you can put these patients on this therapy if they truly have IPF. Um, the other important thing is the cost of these medications. So you want to get the diagnosis correct because you don't want to wastefully, wastefully be spending money um, on a therapy that the patient doesn't have an approved indication for. And I want to actually show you these figures. So the cost of perfinidone is actually the cost of a small house or a used Ferrari uh, every single year. And Nintetinib is even worse um, with a cost of over $150,000 per year. So it's extremely important to get the correct diagnosis. So let's talk about some of the basic clinical data um, in patients with IPF. Um, so and the reason I'm going over this information with you is because when you pull up your CT scan to look at it, you're gonna look at the clinical history. And it's helpful to know what the typical um, clinical background is of patients with IPF, um, because it can affect your pre-test probability as to what you're going to ultimately call this patient. So typically the patients are over the age of 60 and they're white males. They're often current or former smokers. And the symptoms they have is chronic progressive dyspnea on exertion for at least months, but usually years associated with a dry cough. So it'll typically be a patient who say, states that they have dyspnea on exertion um, with a dry cough for approximately three to five years that's just been gradually getting worse. 
On physical exam, on the notes, you'll notice that the clinician will describe that the patient has crackles on inspiration, um, greatest in the lower lungs, and they usually sound like Velcro. So um, if you remember, um, IPF and you know, UIP and most interstitial lung diseases are restrictive lung diseases, um, which means that the lung has a hard time opening up. So when the patient breathes in, it sounds exactly as though you're opening up the Velcro on a pair of sneakers. Um, the lung makes the sound um, with inspiration and when they breathe out, it sounds very normal. And finally on PFTs, which I wouldn't expect you to necessarily be able to interpret them, but if you looked at the report, you would see that the patient has restriction with a reduced total lung capacity and a reduced diffusion capacity. So now let's move on to the HRCT imaging, which I'm sure you're most excited about. Okay, so two important observations to make. So one is the distribution of findings and two, the actual features that you see on CT. In regards to distribution, UIP has a subpleural basilar predominant distribution. So what that means is that the findings are most common in the lower parts of the lungs and they're out in the periphery adjacent to the pleura. Let's review the four classic features of UIP. So the first is reticulation and subpleural reticulation specifically. So reticulation is basically lines that are overlapping, crisscrossing, almost like the way they crisscross in a mesh or a lattice network. Patients will also have peripheral traction bronchiectasis or bronchiolectasis. And this is basically just dilation of the airways peripherally. And typically we like to say that the dilation should be at least 1.5 times the size of the accompanying pulmonary artery. And I'll show you examples of all of these on the next slide. Um, you'll also see honeycombing. Honeycombing um, pathologically is suspected to represent the end stage of traction bronchiectasis. And in honeycombing, what you see is multiple clustered cysts, often ranging in size from two to 10 millimeters. Um, and they have very well-defined walls, which are approximately one to three millimeters in thickness. And finally, the last classic feature is actually an absence of atypical features. So there's an absence of diffuse ground glass opacification, an absence of scattered thin walled cysts, an absence of nodules, absence of air trapping, any finding that's atypical. Okay, so now looking at the imaging here, you can see a variety of different images and these are all from one patient. In fact, this was a patient who had biopsy proven UIP and was given a diagnosis of IPF um, and they underwent a single lung transplant. So you can see that the normal lung here is the transplanted lung and the diseased lung is the native lung. And so in this coronal image here, you can see that the findings are greatest in the lower lungs um, and they're predominantly all subpleural. So this is a subpleural basilar predominant distribution. In this image here, the arrow is pointing to reticulation. So you can see multiple crisscrossing lines and this is consistent with subpleural reticulation. In this image, you can see all of these clustered cysts the patient has, which is due to honeycombing. And sometimes on an axial image, it can be difficult to appreciate that these are all subpleural. And so when you look at the coronal image, you can really see this nice stack of um, clustered cysts here, thin walled clustered cysts all in a row in a subpleural location, um, consistent with honeycombing. In the bottom left image, you can see um, this is an example of an airway that's dilated out of proportion to the accompanying pulmonary artery. And this is peripheral traction bronchiectasis. And finally, this is an image on expiration showing that there's no evidence of air trapping, which is a finding that you can see with fibrotic HP. Um, patients will often have air trapping on expiration. So the sum of these findings is consistent with a typical UIP pattern. Let me just review a few pearls with you. So the first pearl that I wanted to tell you about is look at the oldest chest CT available. And this is based on a paper from Silva et al. from 2008. And they looked at patients that had fibrotic NSIP and fibrotic HP, and they found that in 28% of these patients, the findings evolved over time and became indistinguishable from UIP, 
which means they went from CT patterns showing NSIP and HP, and over time, the CT would meet the criteria for typical UIP, even though they had biopsy-proven um, alternative diagnoses. So the true answer may only be evident on a CT from five to 10 years prior. So always look at the oldest CT. And the other pearl I wanna mention is do not overcall ground glass opacities as they're not a typical feature of UIP, but they're often apparent. So what do I mean by that? So this is the image from the last slide in the patient with typical UIP. And you might look at this and say, well, this looks like this could be ground glass opacification. But it's important to know that what looks like ground glass opacification is only present in the area of fibrosis. If you look at the lung that's not involved with fibrosis, there's no evidence of ground glass opacification. And so it leads to this point here from this paper. When ground glass opacities are located in areas of fibrotic lung, they most likely represent microscopic fibrosis below the level of detection by CT or secretions within honeycomb lung. Okay, so now that you're familiar with the distribution and the classic features of typical UIP, you have to now determine which category your imaging findings fall into. Okay, so there's one of four categories. So it can either be the typical UIP pattern, which I showed you. It can be a probable UIP pattern, a CT pattern that's indeterminate for UIP, or CT features most consistent with a non-IPF diagnosis. And this categorization comes from the Fleischner Society paper from 2018. And this is the table that goes along with it. Now you might be groaning, and again, thinking of alphabet soup with the help sign, um, but I want to let you know that you don't need to memorize this table. And I have a really easy way of thinking about it when you look at this table. So the first category is typical UIP, which is the features I showed you. And you have all four classic features. There's honeycombing, there's reticulation, there's bronchiectasis, and there's absence of features to suggest an alternate diagnosis. The next category, probable UIP, has all of that, but no honeycombing. So that's pretty easy to know. And if you look at the last category, features most consistent with a non-IPF diagnosis, you're basically looking for features, um, imaging findings that are clearly indicative of something else. So you might have ground glass everywhere that suggests NSIP, or you might have lobular air traffic on expiration to suggest fibrotic HP, or you might see um, diffuse nodules with cysts to suggest LIP. So you're seeing something on your CT suggestive of something else. And if it doesn't fit one of these three categories here, then it's likely gonna fall in the indeterminate for UIP category, which is this other one here. Now I clicked on in the next slide because I wanted to just mention the fact that the ATS multi-society guidelines have a nearly identical table with four categories. The major difference is really the terminology they use. So instead of saying typical UIP, they just say UIP. And instead of saying non-IPF diagnosis, they say alternative diagnosis. And there are a few subtle changes um, in the table. Like, so for example, under probable UIP, they say you can have mild ground glass opacities, but the overall sentiment is the same. There's four categories um, that it's classified into with essentially the same categories, um, features that I described earlier. So that nicely leads us into category number two. So category number one, or criteria number one, was exclusion of a um, known underlying cause. So meaning that the, the findings are not idiopathic. Um, so you need to make sure that the findings are idiopathic in order to meet criteria number one, no known cause of disease. Criteria number two is the presence of an HRCT pattern of UIP, AKA typical UIP. So if your HRCT pattern shows typical UIP and the clinician has ruled out an underlying cause, then you meet the criteria for IPF. But criteria number two has two parts. So if your patient has undergone a biopsy, then you can use the HRCT pattern and the biopsy, the histopathological pattern, and basically categorize them into IPF depending on um, which category they fall under in the HRCT and which category for histology. And that'll tell you what your diagnosis is, whether it's IPF or likely IPF or non-IPF, depending on which category for each. Okay, 
So let me just briefly go over the other categories of UIP. So we talked about what typical UIP is. So probable UIP is um, everything I was saying except for honeycombing. So you still have a subplural basilar predominant distribution. You have subplural reticulation. You have mild peripheral traction bronchiectasis, but there's no honeycombing. So if this patient also had these findings of honeycombing, then it would then push them into the typical UIP category. For indeterminate for UIP, um, patients may ha still have mild subpleural reticulation, but when you look at the distribution, it's pretty diffuse. So there's no zonal distribution. And so importantly, this patient does not have honeycombing. They don't have traction bronchiectasis but they also don't have definite features to suggest an alternate diagnosis. So if you told me this was UIP, it would still be believable. But if you said that they had NSIP, that could also be believable. So it falls into an indeterminate category. And then finally, here's an example of alternative diagnosis. So when you look at these images here, you can see that the patient has basilar predominant opacities, but there's subpleural sparing. So immediately adjacent to the pleura, it's spared, it's, it's clear. And so this finding is not extremely sensitive, but it's more specific for NSIP. And then when you look in the upper lobes, you can see that there's a lot of ground glass present outside of the areas of fibrosis. So these findings both suggest a diagnosis of NSIP. And this would be an example of alternative diagnosis. So just to kind of point out, why is categorization important? So the positive predictive value of the radiologic diagnosis of UIP, typical UIP on HRCT for a pathologic diagnosis of UIP is 90 to 100%. So what that means is as the radiologist, if you call typical UIP, there's a 90 to 100% chance that the pathology will also agree and be concordant. And in that situation, you don't need to get a surgical lung biopsy. Furthermore, if you call probable UIP on CT, um, this study has shown that 82 to 94% of patients will actually also have histology that agrees that this is either probable or definite UIP. And so this is where the two um, society guidelines differ. So the Fleischner Society guidelines state that um, for either probable UIP or typical UIP, they don't suggest a biopsy because these odds are pretty good um, for it actually being UIP. However, the ATS and multi-society guidelines state that for probable UIP, they still suggest getting a biopsy, whether that's surgical or bronchoscopic. And so the point is, is that surgical lung biopsy is not recommended in patients with UIP, AKA typical UIP, and it's often avoidable in patients with probable UIP. And in that situation, it really highlights the importance of a multidisciplinary discussion with the clinician, the radiologist, and the pathologist to decide whether or not a biopsy is appropriate. And if it is performed, whether the diagnosis truly is UIP, and if you exclude any underlying cause, if it's actually IPF. So now I'm just gonna lead into a few summary questions here. So perfinidone and intetinib are approved for UIP, IPF, NSIP, all of the above or none of the above. So as we discussed, the answer is IPF. These are two antifibrotic agents and this is why it's so important to really arrive at whether or not the diagnosis is IPF or not. As radiologists, it's critical to state whether the diagnosis is UIP or IPF on the dictation. And the answer to this is false. As radiologists, we're not taking a clinical history. So we don't know whether these findings are idiopathic or not. So we're only stating whether the diagnosis is UIP and which category of UIP it would fall into. What happens to fibrosing ILDs over time? They can evolve over time into a UIP pattern they often evolve over time into NSIP or fibrotic HP. They can and often for progress, but the pattern almost always stays the same, or D, none of the above. And the answer in this case is they can evolve over time into a UIP pattern, which is what I discussed in that SOBA paper from 2008, in which 28% of patients progress into a pattern that's indistinguishable from UIP. 
which is not a common feature of UIP. Reticulation, ground glass opacities outside of fibrotic lung, peripheral traction bronchiectasis, or honeycombing. And the answer is ground glass opacities outside of fibrotic lung is not a common feature of UIP. And finally, it's important to note that ground glass opacities located only within areas of fibrotic lung likely represent microscopic fibrosis, but do not respond to steroids. True or false? And this answer is true. When you see ground glass within areas of fibrosis, it likely represents microscopic fibrosis. So it's important not to overcall the ground glass opacities, or at least to state that there's no ground glass outside of the areas of fibrosis. I hope you learned a little bit about diagnosing IPF. And if you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. This is Avio Portland um, from OHSU Hospital. Um, we have a fantastic cardiothoracic fellowship program. So I hope that you apply. Thank you so much.